Okay, hi everybody. So uh, today we're going to talk about hybrid musical instruments. So this is going to be a somewhat technical class, uh, but also like some lecture because we're actually going to start with a uh, lecture. And this is also going to be the topic of the lab that you're going to have to do and homework that you're going to have to do next week. So uh, we're already kind of anticipating uh, next week's uh, lab. Okay. Uh, cool. So hybrid instruments. So hybrid instruments are kind of an uh, ambiguous uh, term because uh, people actually use it to talk about uh, many, many, many uh, different things. But in the context of this class, uh, it's mostly uh, going to be designing. Uh, or sorry, designating uh, instruments that are combining physical and virtual uh, elements. Okay. So, uh, as I'm sure you know by now, uh, this is the uh, digital musical instrument. So that's like the uh, DMI. So why is it the DMI? Well, because you have controller. And the controller is connected to something that computes sound. Okay, so uh, here it's a computer. Apparently, it's making a trumpet sound. Uh, but uh, in your case, for the class, uh, that would be the Teensy, and uh, and then the interface are the sensors that you're connecting to the Teensy. Okay. So usually when you think about digital musical instruments, uh, you think about something like this. Yeah, like there's a controller and something that generates sound. This is something that we already talked about during the first class uh, that we had, you know, and the fact that uh, this is actually uh, the defining component of musical instruments. You know, like the fact that uh, you have a separated uh, control interface from uh, the place where sound is actually being uh, produced. So the, the problem with this uh, is uh, something that Perry Cook, uh, so you know, we already talked a little bit about Perry Cook in this class. Uh, he, uh, he was actually a PhD student at Karma a very, very long time ago, like uh, maybe 30 years ago or something like this. You know, then eventually became a professor at Princeton, uh, and uh, now he's retired. Uh, but uh, he's a big figure in the field of new interfaces for musical expression. And one of the many things that he said is DMI, so digital, digital musical instruments, are often dematerialized, uh, resulting in a loss of intimacy between uh, performer and instrument. So, uh, well, dematerialized is kind of a weird uh, word, uh, and uh, I'm not really sure uh, this is even like an actual word, no, like, but, uh, but basically what he means uh, by this, you know, is that uh, because you have so much freedom in terms of uh, the selection of the interface and, uh, and its design and so much freedom also on the sound synthesis algorithm that are, you're going to use to actually synthesize sound, that uh, this sort of results in a, a lack of connection between the performer and the instrument. Okay. So, a very uh, good way to think about this is, for example, the guitar. You know, if you think about a guitar, uh, the interface and the way sound is produced are the same thing, right? Like, the strings are both the interface and the thing that actually generates the sound, you know? Like, so, so it means that as a performer, the connection you're going to have with the instrument is very direct because you're directly interacting with the thing that actually produces the sound, okay? With uh, digital musical instruments, it's a little bit more complicated because you do whatever you want. You know, you have total control as a musical instrument designer on uh, the kind of interface you're going to have and the kind of sound that is going to, to control, you know? And so, so what Perry means by this is that uh, very often, uh, digital musical instruments miss the point because uh, uh, they 
uh, break the connection between the performer and the instrument. So uh, there is a family of instruments, of digital musical instruments, that sort of uh, reconcile those two things uh, in a somewhat natural uh, way. And they, ha they are the so-called hybrid instruments. Okay. And uh, we already talked about the Korg wave drum uh, during the first class, but the first class, is, uh, the, this instrument is one, uh, is one of them. Okay, so, uh, so the Korg wave drum uh, is a, a drum instrument. It's not an interface, so we're not going to call it a controller. It is actually an instrument, which means that uh, its output is not like a MIDI cable, or it's not like a USB MIDI cable. It is an audio output, okay? And uh, in this instrument, combines uh, a membrane, like, which is like an actual drum membrane, with uh, physical models of drums, okay? So what happens on the wave drum is that when you tap it, the sound that you produce on the membrane gets uh, picked up with contact microphones, okay? And then it is fed into resonators, uh, which are digital resonators, okay? Uh, this is something that you're gonna have to do as part of the lab, okay? So dealing with digital resonators implemented in Faust, you know? And so they are basically very uh, primitive physical models, uh, if we can call them like, uh, like this, okay? So basically, again, uh, the idea is that you capture the sound on the membrane and then you use the sound that you produced on the membrane to drive those uh, physical models, okay? So why would you do this? Because, uh, so I know that uh, many of you don't necessarily have background with this, you know, like, but when you make physical models of musical instruments, if you make like, mathematical models of musical instruments, uh, usually uh, the body of the instrument is easy to model because it is a very linear system in most cases. You know, like so, so if you think of a tube for a clarinet or a tube for a saxophone or a string or, you know, all these things, they are very linear system because they don't change uh, with time, okay? However, the excitation, so the mouthpiece uh, for the clarinet or uh, the plunge for the string, this is not linear. You know, because the, the, the behavior that you have when you like sort of make a contact with the string and you pluck it, or even when you're bowing the string, you know, like this is a non-linear system. So usually making an accurate model of the excitation that you're going to send into your instrument is something that is hard to model. And, uh, and also, it really depends a lot on the performer. You know, like, so um, it might be very stupid, you know, like, but uh, if you're a guitar player, uh, your fingers are very soft, uh, as opposed to, you know, having like calluses on your fingers, you know, like it's probably gonna change the sound of the, of the guitar a little bit, right? And so, uh, so basically, uh, basically there is uh, there is a lot that happens in the excitation. You know, in fact, uh, like if you make a physical model, the excitation uh, that you send in the model probably uh, plays for maybe eighty percent of the quality of the sound that you're going to produce. Okay. So here, what they do is that they do this sort of smart thing where they're like, okay, we're not going to model the excitation. Uh, we're actually going to pick it up from the real world. So we're actually going to record the sound of an excitation. And then we're going to use the sound of this excitation to drive the physical model, right? And so that way, it always sounds very natural because every strike you're going to make on the membrane of this instrument is going to sound different because it is natural. So it means that every sound that you're going to produce, uh, even though this is a digital musical instrument, is going to sound different, okay? You know, this is going to make very uh, expressive and very uh, natural sounding musical, uh, musical instruments. So uh, this is a demo video of the Korg wave drum. You know, 
building cell that's weird. really capturing sounds everywhere on the instrument. So there is a pressure sensor, okay? So like when you, when you actually press on the membrane, it blows. So you hear, like depending on where it is striking you with the stick, it doesn't sound the same. And it's not because there is a sensor that's picking up the position of the strike, it's because it sounds different on the instrument depending on where you're striking it. instrument, you know, like because of this sort of mix between uh, uh, physical and virtual. And uh, so I think I already mentioned that during the first uh, class, but Karma has some history with uh, this very specific instrument. You, know, you can actually find the first uh, wave drum in the lobby downstairs uh, in the mess, right? So, uh, so, so if you look for it, uh, you might find it. I think I already mentioned that during the first class, you know, but it's broken uh, because at some point uh, some um, people came and played it a little bit too hard and so they made a hole in it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a pity. And the one downstairs was kind of different from this one, you know, because it, it, it was more like a prototype, you know, like so. Uh, anyway, hey, do you have any questions about this or? No? Okay. So, uh, the wave drum was kind of the first uh, hybrid instrument, and uh, the idea behind the wave drum has been exploited by other people to make uh, hybrid instruments, but for other kinds of instruments than just uh, percussive musical instruments. And uh, Ed Myrtle, we already talked about Ed uh, a lot in this class before. Uh, actually try to export this idea to the guitar. Okay. So Ed used to teach 250A, but like a long time ago, like uh, I think I told you, but uh, like when I took 250A, which was like more than 10 years ago, uh, he was the uh, instructor, the instructor for 250A. And Ed worked a lot on physical modeling of musical instruments and, uh, and as, part, as part of this work on physical modeling of musical instruments, he made a lot of uh, controllers to, to control those physical models. So uh, what he did here, which is kind of a weird thing to do, you know, like, but actually worked uh, really well, is that uh, he wanted to make an electric guitar physical model controller, which would be a hybrid instrument. Okay, so he took an electric guitar, uh, which kind of defeats the purpose, you know, because uh, if you already had an electric guitar, why don't you just use the electric guitar, you know, like, uh, but, uh, but it's okay, you know, like, that was more like an experiment and it worked, you know, like, so why, why not? So he took an electric guitar, uh, he, he removed some of the strings on the electric guitar and he only kept two strings, okay. Then one string, he uh, damped it. So, uh, so like this is some kind of fabric or foam or whatever, you know, that's damping the string so that when you plug the string, you only get the sound of the excitation, okay? So, uh, so like if you plug this string, it just sounds like, 
So that's like the sound of your finger or of the pick actually plucking the string. Okay, so you probably guessed what he did with this. Uh, he took that sound and fit it into a physical model. You know, like so. So exactly the same idea as for the Korg uh, winter. And then uh, he used the outer string to control the pitch of this sound that was produced. And uh, the way he did this was by, uh, uh, I think he put uh, electric wires on all the frets. And so basically when you would press on a string, it would establish contact with the fret, you know, and so he would know which fret is being touched. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so basically, that way, he could actually detect where the finger was on the on the fret. Okay. So this uh, idea, I don't have any video or whatever. Oh my God, goes. Uh, I think when he did this, uh, videos were not uh, still not like really a thing. You know, like so. <laughs> well, I mean, you can make videos, you know, like. But I think he worked on this like around two thousand. 2007, 2006, you know, and, and at that time, like, people were less into videos than now, you know, like, and so, so, uh, so I don't think he made a video for this, but uh, this is Dan Moses Calicord. So Dan Moses uh, took 250A uh, also a long time ago, I think, I would say probably in 2008 or something like that, so 2008, 2009, you know, his final project was uh, a calicord. And the calicord sort of uh, borrows the same idea as Ed Bertel's uh, guitar. And so uh, eventually the calicord became this thing. And I'm going to play the video and explain what's going on. I think that's uh, kind of uh, easier. And then we can talk about it. So what is going on here? Uh, so uh, this part is not necessarily the most interesting one, you know, because he basically just tried to make a keyboard from scratch, you know, like, and, uh, and obviously he's using a capacitive touch something or something like this to do it, you know. Like, so uh, so this part is not particularly interesting, and that's not what uh, uh, we want to look at uh, now. And uh, in fact, like I don't know if you saw, but uh, you could also. Uh, he made this instrument so that you could also plug a MIDI keyboard to it uh, as a substitute for uh, his uh, homemade uh, keyboard. Okay. The interesting part is here. Okay. So what he did uh, with this instrument is that uh, he made those plastic uh, tines. Okay. He gave them this somewhat weird shape, and uh, we're going to talk about the shape. Uh, in just a little uh, bit, okay? And then he glued piezos on to them, you know? So there are piezos in your kit, okay? And, uh, and in fact, for lab four, uh, you're gonna have to use piezos to sort of do something like this, okay? And, uh, well, uh, very briefly, just uh, maybe as a good reminder, so the piezos that you have in your uh, kit, uh, they look like this, right? So that's the piezos that you have in your kit. Okay, so these guys are contact microphones, okay? And uh, you can see that they're actually very cheap. So 
Uh, so one super nice thing about physics. Okay, and so what he did, well, you see one that's kind of sticking out from uh, the body of the instrument over here. So what he did is that he glued uh, piezo discs onto these tines. You know? And so basically when you're plucking a tine, you're picking up the cell that you make on the tine, and then he was using that to drive a physical model of an electric guitar. And the physical model that he's using is very, very basic. It's like super primitive. But it actually sounds pretty good, right? I mean, it sounds like a guitar, right? Even though uh, it's not like a, a physical guitar. And, uh, and the reason why it actually sounds so good, you know, is because of the excitation. And, uh, and the fact that he gets like very natural excitation to drive the, to drive the model. So, can someone guess uh, why he gave this somewhat weird shape to the, the tines? You know, like you, you see, they have like sort of this almost like exponential shape in a way. You know, like so. So there is a reason. Yeah, I think it's so you can kind of control how many at once you're strumming. Um, so you can kind of go down the middle and strum them all when they're all the same height. But then you could also very easily pick just one out. So that's one reason. Yeah, and that's why he sort of put one in this direction and then another one in the other direction. But then, like, there is another reason, which is more like a, a, like a physical or like sound reason. Yeah. Is it because if like he had it all on the same thing, like it would, like I guess the contact mics would touch each other? No, that's not really the. Any other ideas? It's actually important. Maybe you can shape the excitation. Oh, this water. <laughs> Sorry. You can maybe shape the excitation depending on where you pluck on it, uh, or maybe it generates a different sound depending on where you pluck. Exactly. That's the thing. So it sounds very different if you plug here than if you plug here. Okay. So uh, it's kind of a trick, you know. Like, but uh, if you uh, if you take an electric guitar and you pluck the electric guitar close to the bridge, you're gonna get less low frequencies uh, in the excitation than if you pluck it in the middle. Okay, and that's because the mode for low frequencies of the string is like the mode that you drive in the middle. You know, like, like the lowest frequency mode on the string is the mode that basically does this, right? So like those are like the extremities of, this, of the string, right? And like the lowest frequency mode is basically a mode that's resonating like this, right? And so, so if you plug the string in the middle, uh, you get a lot of low frequencies in your excitation because you're driving a lot that low frequency mode, okay? Now, if you plug the string on uh, like the edges, uh, so running on the extremities uh, close to the bridge, then you're naturally driving the low frequency mode, you know, like because you're very far, well, from the middle of the string, and so uh, so that's why it sounds different when you plug a string uh, on like close to the bridge than if you plug it like closer to the middle. Okay, so basically the way. Uh, the reason why Dan actually did this is so that you could sort of control the plucking position of the string. Okay, so basically, if, if you're plucking here, uh, it's more like you're plucking in the middle of the string, and like the more you're plucking uh, towards like the end of the time, where you're only going to get like high frequencies in your pluck, this is going to sound more like you're plucking near the edge of the string. You know, so. This is pretty cool, you know, because there is no sensor on this thing that's detecting the position of the plug, right? But it's like the position of the plug is embedded basically in the excitation, okay? And uh, and usually when you do physical modeling of musical instruments, uh, especially if you're using waveguides, uh, like did any of you like took like three twenty B or? Music 3, 20B? No? Okay. So, all right, I, I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, uh, it's, uh, maybe it's not that uh, interesting in that context. 
Anyway, so, so this is pretty smart. You know, like you get a different sound for each excitation, and you can also control the plug position just by using this, uh, this approach. Okay, and so uh, this was the first prototype. Uh, this was the second prototype. That was like the 258 project. And he actually wrote a paper uh, for the NIME conference about this. You know, like, so if you want to know more about this instrument, uh, you can have a look at uh, uh, the corresponding, uh, corresponding paper. And it was really, really well done. You know, like, that was his final project for 258. You know, like, uh, and so with uh, his hands here, he could plug the strings because they were like those little tiny, I can show you actually, because that's uh, interesting. So, so this is a, one kind of piezos. Those are piezo discs, okay? Uh, but there also exist uh, piezo films. And they are kind of harder to find uh, in general. Okay, yeah, yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is a piezo film. And a piezo film is a soft piezo, okay? So, uh, so the way uh, Dan actually built uh, this instrument was by uh, buying a bunch of those. I think there is a couple in the Max Lab. There are not too many because uh, they're expensive. So, uh, so we don't want them. You, we don't want you guys to just take all of them, basically. Okay. So, uh, so basically, uh, what Dan did is that uh, he took piezo films and then they would pop out of the, the body of the instrument, and they would be like the thing that you actually pluck. Okay, and this is a microphone. Okay, so basically, if you plug this, you really record the sound of your finger, like basically plucking this piece of plastic. Okay, and uh, and then again, like for uh, his final version, he decided to go with piezo discs. You know, like those, it was more practical to glue piezo discs to. Uh, to uh, these uh, plastic uh, tines, but piezo films are actually pretty cool if you want to make this kind of uh, this kind of instruments. They're very hard to solder because they melt. Uh, so, so if you like solder them, you have to solder very very fast. Uh, otherwise, they, they will just like. Another cool thing about this instrument is that he could actually control, uh, I don't remember what power meter, but he could control something by sort of rotating the instrument. So you see there are like two faces. So there was like some kind of axis in the middle. And so, uh, so basically he could actually like move this face in function of this one. And, uh, and so, uh, so that was also like some kind of control uh, that he would get uh, on, uh, on this instrument. Do you have any questions about this or no? Yeah. Yeah, so I see that there's like five different strings. How does each string control? Is it like a portion of the keyboard that when he, because I heard that when he plucks the low string, it's a lower sound. But what if there's no low key pressed down? Does it just make no sound? Yeah, that's a very good question because uh, you guys are probably going to have to deal with stuff like this when you work for your uh, when you work on your final project. So thank you for asking that question. So here it's tricky because basically the way it works is that each string needs to go through an independent audio channel. Okay, so uh, if you wanted to make this instrument with the Teensy or at least uh, the way uh, you get the Teensy as part of your kit, you would not be able to do it. Because the Teensy, uh, which you have in your, well, it's not even the Teensy, it's the audio shield of the Teensy, only has two audio inputs, okay? Here, he's using something that has one, two, three, four, five, I thought there were six. Okay, well, maybe there is another one you can see it. Okay. He's using, uh, yeah, he's using like five audio inputs, okay? And uh, so basically each audio input is going to an independent uh, physical model, okay? So basically, uh, so uh, this is, you <laughs> know, uh, like, you need to trash those. This one, this one. Okay, cool. So basically, uh, 
basically, uh, he has uh, like five piezos, okay? And uh, those are like the piezos. Each piezo is going through uh, an audio input, okay? So here there is an ABC, okay? And uh, same for here, same for here, same for here, same for here. Okay? Well, those guys are all the same, okay? That. Okay. Uh, I hear. Follow me. Yeah. Cool. And then uh, each of these guys is going through an independent uh, physical model of a string. Okay. So it's a very physical system in a way. It's it's like a, it's like what you would do with a real uh, with a real guitar. You know, like so. So basically, if you wanted to do something similar uh, with the TNT, again, it would be complicated because you only have two audio inputs on the TNT. And uh, there are tricks, I guess, you could use, you know, like, but, uh, but I think you would, like, if you wanted to do this on the TNT, you would have to spend a lot of time figuring this part out. And, uh, and it's not necessarily uh, what we. Like we prefer if you guys in Tupu TA spend a lot of time thinking about the interaction you're going to have uh, with the instrument rather than solving complex engineering problems. Uh, this is not necessarily like super simple to, to solve. And, uh, and so then uh, I think what happens when uh, he's using the keyboard uh, is that uh, if he's pressing two keys, uh, he knows that if he's pressing two keys, uh, it's allocated to the first and to the second string, you know, like, or something like this, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, so in a way, the keyboard in this context, I think is somewhat counterintuitive, you know, like, so, uh, so, but then those are like design decisions, you know, and, uh, and so he made this kind of decisions, and uh, if you were to make something like this, uh, you would probably make your own decisions anyway. And obviously, like the sound of uh, all the models uh, is added uh, into one single signal. Okay. Cool. Any other question? Cool. Okay, that's another one. Uh, so this one is kind of dead. Uh, so it was like a, a product. Uh, I think they tried, didn't work, and. Uh, so you will probably never hear about it again. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Like it's very similar to uh, the wave drum. You know, like so. So basically, you have a membrane, and uh, the membrane is connected to contact microphones, and then uh, the sound that you get from the contact microphones is going through some kind of uh, physical uh, physical model. Um, but we spend a fair amount of time thinking about the design, you know, and uh, how beautiful it's going to look like, you know, and, uh, and uh, so uh, so that's cool. Okay, that's another one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to play the video and talk about it after that. kind of the same idea, you know, I, you know uh, there is an app, the app is running a physical model or a bunch of physical models slash resonators and the sound of the microphone of the, the smartphone is uh, used as the source for the excitation to drive those models. Okay, so, uh, so it means that when the guy is playing on the table, it sounds different if you're striking here than if you're striking here, you know, and, uh, and because all these excitations have a different sound, 
those uh, properties get uh, transferred to the physical model automatically. You know, I cannot. So this is pretty cool, and, uh, and uh, it's it's nice, you know, because like, it's simple and uh, it's probably very stable. The only problem with this, you know, is that uh, I don't know if the guy is like sneezing or something like this as he's playing the instrument. Uh, you would probably hear it, you know. Like so, th this only works uh, if you're in a very very quiet environment, you know, and that the only sound that you are sending to your instrument are the sounds that you're making. And because uh, again, he's using the microphone of the smartphone as an audio input uh, for the model, you know, and so so that's why when he drops the coin on the table, uh, you hear sound, you know, like, uh, and so uh, so that's the limitation, I guess, of this. I don't, I don't know if people use that, you know, like, but but I thought it was an interesting uh, example. So this one we already talked about it during the first class. Uh, that's the emojis and. Uh, I will uh, play this video so that Emojis allows you to transform anything around you into a musical instrument. Okay. <laughs> so you could make emojis very easily with your kit, you know, and, uh, and so essentially what they do is uh, they have a contact microphone that they can put on any surface, and the contact microphone is connected to a smartphone that's running an app, and the app is running a like, bunch of physical models slash resonators, you know, like, so basically emojis is kind of similar to this, except that instead of using the built-in microphone or the smartphone, they're using a contact microphone. And uh, they also do some uh, AI uh, stuff to sort of, you know, we already talked about this during the first class, but uh, that's kind of the interesting part about this instrument, actually. Like, they, uh, they have a machine learning algorithm that can tell where you're striking on a surface, because it doesn't sound the same if you're striking here than if you're striking here. And so the, phys uh, the physical model, sorry, the, uh, uh, the machine learning uh, model can actually tell uh, in real time if you're striking here or if you're striking uh, there. And so, uh, so then not only they're using uh, the audio uh, input as an excitation, but they're also changing parameters of the model depending on uh, the results of the analysis of the sound by the uh, artificial intelligence uh, model. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, this one is more uh, from the uh, uh, NIME, uh, so new interfaces for musical expression community, and uh, it's called the Caress. And the caress was uh, made by Ali Mumedi. Ali Mumedi is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and uh, he's he's kind of my uh, counterpart at Carnegie uh, Mellon University. Uh, he teaches the class on physical interaction design for for music, and so it's exactly the same idea, you know, like, except that uh, you have different surfaces, uh, and those different surfaces have a uh, piezo glued at the bottom, and they all have different textures, and because they, have, they all have different textures, when you're touching them, it sounds uh, different, basically. You know, like so, so maybe like one of them is very smooth, so you get like a very smooth sound, you know, and one of them is very scratchy, so you get like a more uh, scratchy sound. And then he's using that to drive uh, physical models uh, that are obviously running outside of this thing, uh, which is why he has this big apps connector to connect uh, this to probably an audio uh, interface. So uh, usually, like people like Lab Four uh, because they make things like this. You know, and you'll see it's actually very satisfying to work on this kind of instruments, you know, because they, they sound pretty good, you know, like, uh, and so, so, uh, so there are many people in the class who end up, like, building their final project around the idea of what we're doing in lab for, you know, trying to make a hybrid uh, instrument. 
So there's one thing uh, you need to think about if you're going in this direction, uh, which is always a problem, and this instrument is a very good example of this problem, is that you get a lot of cross-talk uh, when you uh, build instruments like this. You know, like, so here, Ali wanted to have you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different surfaces. You know, like, so, so it's the same idea as here. He needs eight audio inputs, right? And each surface is controlling a model, just like in this figure. Okay? The problem is that uh, because, they're, because he's using piezos and they are contact microphones, if you do something on this surface, this one probably picks it up too a little bit, you know, because those two elements are connected through like, the physical body of the instrument. And so you see that he spends a fair amount of time trying uh, to limit the effect of crosstalk using, uh, well, uh, mechanical solutions. You know, and uh, those mechanical solutions are in this kind of spongy materials that are uh, isolating uh, the surface from the body of the instrument. And then you see that he also made those things, you know, like which probably also limit a little bit the crosstalk between uh, this thing here and this thing here, you know. And uh, and so if you are to make uh, this kind of instrument, uh, crosstalk is potentially annoying, you know, like also because uh, whatever you do on one side will probably be picked up on the other. And uh, piezos are very effective, like they. Uh, You'll see, like they're very satisfying to use, you know. And if you glue them to surface, they will pick every cell you make on the surface, you know. And uh, like if you glue a piezo here, and you're like doing something here, because this material is so stiff, uh, you're probably going to get like very good signal, even though the piezo is glued here, you know. And uh, whether the piezo is glued here or here you're probably not going to make a huge difference in the quality of the sound that you're making, you know, because uh, this is very stiff material that's actually conducting uh, the acoustical wave very, uh, very well. So, uh, so, uh, so it's both good, but it's also potentially, uh, potentially a problem. Okay. All right, one thing that I want to say about this, because uh, I know that some of you are already thinking about this now, uh, and uh, I'm just going to warn you on the fact that it's probably not going to work if you try to do this. Uh, so every year, there's uh, at least one student who's like, all right, I'm going to do something really smart, and I'm going to put a piezo here, and I'm going to put a piezo there, and then I'm going to be able to tell where I'm striking on the table, you know, because I can measure the time difference between the piezos. Okay, see the, the point? And then, and then like, if you add another piezo and you put it like here, then you know like, how things work in, in 2D, right? Like, also, you can do like, triangulation, you know? And uh, so it's not going to work if you do this. <laughs> so, you know, it's not going to work because this material is super stiff. You know, sound travel in the air at a certain speed, you know, 3, 40 meters uh, per, uh, 340? Yeah, I almost forget. 340, 340, 340. Uh, 340 meters per second. In this piece of wood, it's much faster because it's much stiffer, you know? And so the time difference between uh, like a piezo, which is going to be here, and a piezo, which is going to be here, uh, is not going to be really visible. If there is going to be a difference, but the sampling rate that you use for your audio interface, uh, which is usually like 48k, is not going to be high enough to be able to tell you like precisely where the striking position is going to be. And I've seen a lot of people trying to go down the rabbit hole and trying to uh, you know uh, solve this, but they don't do it. So. Uh, don't try to go down the rabbit hole. Like I'm telling you from the beginning, it's not going to work. If you use AI, it might work. Okay, but if you don't use AI, it's not going to work. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a video. This. Well, 
you get the point. The demo video is not that great, but... Yeah, yeah I wonder what's going to happen the day when there is really an earthquake. You know, in, uh, like, with the projector, you know, because uh, it's already, like... <laughs> well, I don't know if you heard, like, you know, like, during the earthquake in 1989, uh, I think it was 89, right? Uh, Karma was pretty damaged, you know, like, because uh, it's an old building, you know, and, uh, and it's all, like, it's kind of weird, like, very few people know about this, you know, like, but the building is made out of concrete, and, uh, and uh, it's the first uh, building made out of concrete that was made on the west coast. And uh, there was no other, because it's from 1916. 1916 is very old uh, as far as concrete is concerned. You know, like most uh, concrete buildings are from after that. You know, and concrete and earthquakes, uh, especially if they're not really designed for that, they don't work very well together. You know, like this is very stiff. So it tends to, to break. And so during the, 1960, uh, during the 1989 earthquake, uh, Chris Chafe, so the, the director of Karma, he was on the stage and uh, he was playing piano and he actually went through <laughs> with the piano. <laughs> and uh, so not completely, like the piano actually, <laughs> Like uh, it, it didn't go in the classroom, you know. Like, but uh, but it only went partially through the floor, and so uh, so uh, so like if you take two twenty eight and uh, and like the garbage truck is going in the street and you hear like low frequencies, like Chris stops teaching, like those uh, uh, brings bad memories. So uh, anyway, it's a little bit part of history. And then after that, the, the third floor was condemned, so, uh, so people couldn't go on the third floor for like at least 10 years uh, until the building was remodeled in 2007, and then, uh, and then like, people could go back on the third floor, and then very weird stuff were happening there. There were like even students living on the third floor, uh, like secretly, and, uh, and, and the, way they were, the way they knew about this is because uh, Nando, our assistant man, one day installed new curtains in his office, you know, because he was tired of the old curtains. And, and one day the curtain disappeared, you know, and it was like, where are my curtains? You know? And then started looking for the curtains and uh, he was like, okay, I'm gonna go check on the third floor. You know, like, uh, even though it was condemned, like you could go there, he had the key, he went there. And then he found like a room where, with his curtains. <laughs> And a bed, you know, like in a like deco, and, and basically someone was living there, you know, <laughs> so, but no one knew about this. So, uh, so this is uh, it's kind of a funny, uh, funny story. Anyway, I worked a lot on uh, this kind of instruments, you know, and on, uh, on uh, hybrid instruments uh, when I uh, was at the beginning of my period at Karma about ten years ago, and so. Uh, so this is a bunch of instruments that I've made, uh, and that are like hybrid instruments. And uh, so uh, this one here is the black box, and that was actually my 258 project, uh, which involved a geodesic dome. Uh, and uh, so, so at the time, so uh, by the way, you guys are welcome to do this. Uh, when I took 258, uh, some people preferred to work uh, in groups. Okay, and. Uh, and one thing that worked really well, and I feel like this is potentially something that could happen this year, uh, was uh, if there were a group of two or three people where you have like one mechanical engineer and one person who's more like a uh, karma or uh, like a sound person, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and so that's what happened for this project, you know, and the only reason why uh, this thing ended up uh, being so advanced from a mechanical standpoint is because we were lucky, well, I was lucky to have in my group this guy called uh, David Meisenholder, uh, who was uh, in the D school and who actually knew how to make this kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, so it, for your final projects, if you want to work as a group, uh, please do it, you know, I feel so, uh, well, the expectations will not be the same, right? Like we know that uh, if there are two people, uh, then uh, you should do something better than if you're just one person, okay? But, uh, but like, think about it. You know, like, I feel like this, uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty uh, pretty cool. So yeah, like the, the way this, uh, can I zoom in? No, I cannot zoom in. 
Uh, well, the way this worked uh, was that you had this cube that was hanging from the middle of the geodesic dome, and, uh, and when you would touch its surfaces, it would actually pick up the sound that you make on the surfaces of uh, the cube, and run that through some kind of physical model that would be specialized on different speakers uh, inside the dome. And, uh, and so uh, that was in the lobby upstairs, like in the Karma lounge, and, uh, and uh, there were XR meters, and you could like shake it, you know, and, uh, and uh, one day we uh, put it on campus, uh, when big concert hall opened, they, they had, there was like a big exhibit, you know, and, uh, and we put it there, and, uh, and this uh, drunk guy just showed up and uh, destroyed it. But, you know, that's the fate of uh, any uh, piece of art eventually to be destroyed, right? So, so in the end, like, it was okay, you know, like, we're not too sad about it, you know, like, you know, and we we're like, yeah, that, that was like part of the history of this thing, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, and the geodesic dome went in the garage for a while, and, uh, and one day it disappeared. So, uh, so someone probably uh, took it to make something with it. So. Anyway, uh, so among all these instruments that I've made, this one is probably the most advanced one that I that I made, like using this kind of uh, idea, you know. And, uh, and uh, Julius Smith named it the blade axe. So. Uh, I didn't, I just want to uh, say. And so, uh, so basically that was a physical model controller for electric guitar. So, uh, so you would have uh, electric guitar physical model running uh, on the iPad uh, in custom made apps. And, uh, and then the, the plugs that you would make uh, with your right hand on these two surfaces would be used to drive uh, the physical model on the uh, on the iPad. So, um, and uh, it was made on the CNC machine in the garage, uh, and uh, and then, uh, but it's it's gone now. So, or no, actually, it's not gone because they came yesterday to pick it up, and uh, and when they saw it, they were like, "Okay, we're we're gonna need a power jack." So, <laughs> so they uh, they're, it's still there, but uh, probably next week it's gonna be gone. Anyway, uh, do you have any questions about this, maybe, or thoughts? Yeah? Why does the, um, why did the, 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 I don't know, the app, the, why does the app shape that way to get like the notes like descending and then ascending? Uh, the what, I'm not sure, what, what do you mean? Like the, like, like I, I assume when you, when you, when you tap somewhere on the iPad, it's, it's, Gonna do that note when you tap it. Yeah. Right. Um, so what was how how were they designed like that? So like. Yeah. So here there were like two tines, okay, and uh, so two things they could pluck. One was for strumming, and one was for uh, playing solo. And uh, so the strumming uh, time would strum six virtual strings at the same time. And depending on how fast you would strum it, uh, it would strum like slower or faster, okay? And uh, so you had like this um, interface at the bottom here that was for chords. So, so you could actually like choose a chord and, uh, and so, uh, so you could like strum, you know, and, and basically like choose your chords, okay? And then uh, there was this keyboard, and the way the keyboard worked was that if you pressed one key, it would activate one string. If you pressed two keys, it would activate two strings. And if you press like three keys, it would activate three strings. But you would then play, uh, pluck all of them with the same time, basically. So, so there was only one time associated to this keyboard here. And so, uh, so if you uh, were not touching the string and just like plucking, you would not get sound. Uh, if you were pressing one key, then you would get like one string. And if you were pressing two keys, then you would get two strings. You know, that's kind of the way it worked. And then uh, those were just like parameters that you could control, you know, like, you know. And so, uh, so yeah, that was uh, kind of the idea. But uh, basically, like, there was no Arduino or no like Teensy or whatever in this thing. There was basically just an uh, a small audio, like USB audio interface. 
So the way uh, this uh, part of the instrument would connect to the iPad was just through USB, and it was an external audio interface. And, uh, and so that's the cool thing about those hybrid instruments. You know, like you, you don't necessarily need sensors. You know, like you, you get so much information from the excitation that you can already like do a lot of uh, things with it. So cool. So. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the lab, uh, just to sort of give you an idea of what's, uh, uh, of how this all uh, works, basically. Okay. So, uh, so for the lab, you're going to have to uh, deal with kidzos. Okay. And there are kidzos as part of your kit, and uh, it's these guys. Okay. Uh, the way those instruments uh, work is kind of always the same, and uh, the idea is that you have a sound source, the sound source is being picked up by a piezo or a microphone, okay? Uh, then it's going through an ADC, the ADC is the audio shield, okay? And then there is some kind of resonator, maybe some audio effects, and then you get the audio output, okay? So uh, the piezos that you have as part of your kit just look like this. Uh, the thing is, they have pre-soldered wires onto them. You don't want to use those. Uh, why don't you want to use those? Uh, because if you use piezos as contact microphones, you need shielded wires. Uh, and uh, this is okay if you use the piezo as a sensor. So say like you're connecting your piezo to the Teensy to a digital input of the TNZ, for example, and uh, you just want to say, uh, I'm detecting the fact that I'm striking the stable, then it's fine if you just use those wires. If you want to get an audio signal out of the piezo, you need to use a shielded wire. Why do you need to use a shielded? So do you know what a shielded wire is? No? Okay. So this is actually important. Uh, so in audio, uh, equipments. Uh, if you uh, need to send an analog audio signal over a long distance, uh, you always need to have a shielded wire. So what is a shielded wire? Shielded wire is a wire where you're going to have uh, the positive uh, wire slash pin in the middle, okay? And then this wire is going to be surrounded by another wire so it means that it's a coaxial cable, okay? And this wire is going to be connected to the ground, okay? So basically, you have like one wire, and around this wire, you have another wire that's kind of, you know, wrapped around the other wire, and that wire is connected to the ground, okay? And, the, and, and that's called a shielded cable. Why is it shielded? Because basically, the grounded wire that goes everywhere around the other wire is protecting the positive signal from any electromagnet electromagnetic disturbances that you might have in your room. You know, like you, you know that if you have a long wire, it's like an antenna, basically, right? So to prevent the antenna effect, you use shielded wires. So you use shielded wires in uh, two different contexts. Uh, one is you need a very long wire, okay? And uh, so say that, uh, well, people don't really do that anymore, you know? Like, but, uh, but like, even like 10 years ago, people would still do that. Like if you have like a stage uh, for a concert and, uh, and you have the mixer, which is uh, at the back of the room, then you need, you needed a lot of XLR cables to run between the between the mixer and the stage, and those cables uh, are usually very long. You know, because like, the mixer is potentially very far from the stage. When you do this, you need shielded wires because otherwise your signal gets contaminated by any electromagnetic disturbances that there might be in the room uh, on the way. Okay, so if you need long cables, you use shielded wires. Like all the Ethernet cables you have in this room are probably shielded because they're very long. You know, like that's a very standard thing to do. Another reason why you would need shielded wires is if you use something that produces an electric current, which is very, very, very low. Okay, so kids actually produce 
current, okay? A microphone doesn't really produce a current, okay? A piezo actually produces a current. So it means that if you take a piezo and uh, you connect it to uh, an oscilloscope and you hammer the piezo, you're gonna see like a burst of uh, electricity. And piezos actually can produce a lot of power. Like these piezos, like these tiny guys, like if you do what I said, like if you hammer it, you can probably generate a current of like 20,000 volts uh, for like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second. You know, like so, so it's going to be too short for you to uh, feel it, you know, but, uh, but basically you can generate a lot of like super high voltage with, with a piezo. And there are a lot of people who actually try to use the that to actually produce energy, you know, like, you know, and so uh, at some point it was a startup that wanted to put like piezos everywhere on roads, so that when cars are actually driving on roads, uh, they, uh, they they actually generate power by you know like pushing on those piezos. So anyway, uh, if you're not hammering the piezo uh, and if you're just like using it to pick up sound, the signal you get from the piezo is very 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 low. And because it's very low, it can be easily contaminated by electromagnetic uh, disturbances. So uh, you need to use shielded wires, okay? So uh, in the max lab, you're going to have to find uh, the coaxial cable, which is over here, and uh, you're going to have to solder it to the piezo. I'm showing you how it works. So that's the co coaxial cable. See, like this is the ground. The ground is going around the positive pin, okay? So uh, you need to insulate those two things. And then uh, you're just going to cut the cables that are part of the, the, the piezo. And then you're just going to solder the coaxial cable directly onto the piezo. So you don't necessarily have to do this, but it's better if you do it. Okay? And uh, it's going to sound much better if you actually uh, insulate the uh, well, if you, if you do that, okay. Cool, uh, then you're gonna have to assemble a proper uh, cable. It's gonna look like this, okay? So uh, you have a jack connector uh, as part of your kit. You're gonna have to connect it, you know, so, so there is gonna be a fair amount of soldering to do for, for this, okay? Uh, one thing you need to know about piezos uh, is that if you want them to work well, you need to glue them, okay? Uh, if you just take a piezo, you put it here, and you tape it, you're gonna get a very, very low signal. For piezos to work, you need very good coupling between the piezo and the surface, okay? Uh, so it means that uh, for this lab, uh, it's possible that you might have to sacrifice your piezo. Okay. And, uh, and by sacrificing your piezo, I mean like actually gluing it to something. You know, I don't know. And once it's glued, uh, it's glued, right? Like you're probably not going to be able to reuse it. Piezos are very, very, very cheap. Uh, we have lots of them in the in the Max Lab. You know, like so. So if you need more piezos, we can give you more piezos. That's not a problem. Okay. So you should feel comfortable uh, sacrificing your piezo. Uh, another thing that I want to tell you about the piezo when you're going to do this is that once this is done, you get a lot of torque with the cable. Okay, so it means that it's very easy to break the piezo once you've done this. So you want to manipulate it very, very gently. You know, you know, because if you do that, you're just going to break it. Okay, so uh, so be careful when you manipulate the, the piezo. You don't want to solder it for too long too. Like if you heat it for like more than say four seconds, you might just destroy it. Okay, so uh, so this is very delicate. You uh, take your time and, uh, and you go slow. You, know, you don't heat the piezo with a solder iron for too long. Glue, if you use glue, you want to use super glue, okay? Or epoxy, or you know, some some stiff glue. Okay, don't use hot glue. 
hot glue uh, is too soft. Uh, and because it's too soft, it's going to act as a low pass filter. So if you want like good coupling uh, between the piezo and the surface, you need super glue. Okay? And if you want it to stick really well, you probably want to sand the surface to which you're going to glue uh, the piezo on. Okay? So if you're gluing the piezo on cardboard, for example, then you're not going to sand the cardboard, of course. You know, but but if you're uh, if you're gluing the piezo onto, I don't know, like a piece of plastic, which is very very like acrylic, for example, uh, then you should sand the acrylic so that you get like a better contact between the the piezo and the and the, and the, the material. Do, do you have any questions about this or? Should be pretty straightforward. Oh, one last thing uh, that I just want to say. So, there's one thing that's slightly tricky with dealing with uh, coaxial cables uh, and soldering them, and uh, it's that if you heat the coaxial cable for too long with a soldering iron, uh, you might melt it. Uh, and because you see, know, like the way those uh, coaxial cables work is that. Uh, so you have the positive pin, you have the ground, but then between the two, there is some insulating material, right? And uh, very often, what happens is that if you heat up the shielding for too long, uh, it's actually going to melt the, uh, the the insulating material between the shielding and the positive pin, and then you're you're going to just have a short between the two, and then uh, your cable is not going to going to work. So. Maybe one thing that you want to do is you want to uh, use a multimeter to test if those two pins are touching each other, right? Like with the multimeter, like before you plug it, uh, you check that uh, you didn't melt the coaxial uh, cable. Any any questions or those are more like tips, you know? And uh, I know you're going to run into those problems, so uh, so this is why I'm talking about this. All right, so once you have this assembly, you're going to want to connect that to your Teensy. How do you connect that to the Teensy? Well, you're going to have to uh, do some soldering on the uh, audio shield as well. So as part of your kits, you should have female jack connectors. Okay? And uh, the point is uh, you then want to connect the male jack connector to the female jack connector. Where is the female jack connector going to be connected? It's going to be connected to the microphone input on the audio shield. Okay. The audio shield has two sets of inputs. It has a microphone input and then it has a line input. See, the line input is here and it's stereo. So you have two channels for the line input. For the mic input, it's mono, and uh, you access it here. Do you know what the difference is between a microphone input and a line input? What? Yes, exactly. So uh, the mic input is uh, connected to a preamp. Okay? And the preamp is an amplifier uh, that can be adjusted depending on the gain of what you're going to send to the, the system. Okay? So means that if you need to make your piezo louder, you can do it using the preamp, which is built in inside the auto shield. Okay? With the line input, there is no preamp. means that Whatever you're connecting to the line input is going straight to the ADC. Okay, so uh, so usually when you use a microphone or you use a piezo or anything like this, it has to go first through a preamp. Like on this mixer here in the room, there are preamps, and you can adjust their gain. And uh, and so just the same way, the TZ audio shield has a built-in preamp that you can configure from the Arduino code. Okay, so then you will solder this, and eventually your assembly should look like this. Okay, this one is bad because uh, it's, uh, 
I don't know, those are uh, COVID uh, era pictures uh, that I took on uh, my kitchen table in France, you know, like so, uh, so <laughs> like at the time, like things were a bit complicated, you know, like so, uh, so we did whatever, what we, uh, what we could. Uh. Anyway, uh, one last thing that I want to say about this is that uh, I forgot, but there is, and this is important, especially if you don't know those things. So. In the kits, there is the possibility that some of you have stereo jack, uh, female jack connectors, and it, there is a possibility that some of you have mono uh, female jack connectors. Same thing for uh, the male jack connector. I think some of you have stereo male jack connectors, and some of you have uh, mono female and male jack connectors. Okay. For those of you who have the mono male jack connectors and mono female connectors, it's very straightforward because you just have to do what's uh, in the tutorial. Okay. If you have stereo ones, then it's slightly more complicated. You know, I just want to talk about this very, very briefly. So. Uh, So, how do you how can you tell the difference? Uh, well, I'm sure you know, but I just want to show you. I guess I'll just do this. Okay, yeah, perfect. So, this is stereo. It is stereo because you have one, two, three pins. Okay. So this is stereo. Mono only has two. One, two. Okay. So if you have mono, it's easy because then there is only two wires. This is the ground. This is the positive pin. Okay. If you have stereo, you need to solder inside the connector those two pins together, okay? And the point, like this one and this one should be soldered together. The point is that uh, you want to make this connector look like this connector, right? So basically what you do is that you solder those two pins together. Same thing for the female. The female is going to have three uh, outputs. Three, uh, you can connect three wires to the female connector. You need to solder the, so usually this is left, and this is right, and this is the ground, okay? So you want to solder the right and the ground together also on the female side, okay? So I know this is, this is like a tiny detail, you know, like, but, uh, but this is kind of important. So, uh, so you want to make sure that you actually take care of this. Yes? Okay, so since we're talking about this, because I think this is also somewhat uh, important, uh, at least for your uh, culture in this field. So, do you know what a TRS cable is? Yes, okay. Can someone explain to me what TRS means? So why do you need TRS cables? For balance or for signals. But balance what? signals. And why do you need balance signals? To avoid noise when you are sending audio through a long cable. There we go. So in the field of professional audio, you have two uh, different kind of connectors. Uh, you have connectors that are unbalanced, and typically this would be an unbalanced connector. You have the ground and you have the signal, 
okay? like the audio signal that you're sending. Okay? And then you have other kinds of connectors that are balanced. And uh, this is something that's somewhat ambiguous, but I think it's important that you guys know about this. You know, like, uh, so if you use an XLR connector, so this is an XLR connector. Uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is XLR. Okay, so if you have a microphone, that's the kind of connector that you typically use. Okay, with XLR, you have one, two, three pins. Okay, but you're only sending one signal, right? It's not stereo, but you're sending only one signal because that's the signal of a microphone, for example. Okay, uh, for um, this kind of connector, you also have one, two, three uh, wires, potentially. So what's ambiguous about jack connectors is that those can either be used as stereo jacks, okay, where you're going to have left, right, and ground, or as TRS connectors. And uh, in, in that case, you can use a uh, like TRS jack connector as a substitute for an XLR connector because they have three pins. Okay, you, you you know what I mean? Or so, why do you need three pins? So it's still a noise issue. So uh, if you need to send an audio signal over a long distance in a cable, shielding is not enough. Uh, shielding is not enough. You're still gonna get some noise in the cable because your cable is starting to act as an antenna. So with TRS cables, what you do is that you do this trick that one of the pin is going to be used as the ground, okay, so that's easy, but then you're going to send your signal, like the, the positive signal, twice. One of them is going to be the original version, one of them is going to be the original version shifted uh, just by pi. So you basically just do like a phase inversion of the signal. Okay, so, so basically you have like your origin of, original signal and you have the, the other signal which had like a phase inversion. And then what you do is that when you receive the signal, you compare those two signals. And if you kind of subtract them, then you, you can actually isolate the noise that was added on the way because of the phase inversion, basically. And so, uh, so the combination of the fact that uh, you use a TRS cable and the fact that it's shielded ensures uh, the fact that you're not going to have too much noise in your signal. Okay? So the reason why I'm talking about this is because uh, those connectors are confusing because they can either be used as TRS or as stereo uh, connectors. Okay? So if this is connected to, uh, to headphones, then it's stereo. But uh, if it's connected to the microphone, uh, it can potentially be used as TRS. Okay, uh, do, do you have any questions about this? Or It's not gonna be very useful for 258, but I feel like uh, for those of you who've never heard about this, like it's, important. it's an important part of the culture of what we do uh, here. So, uh... okay. So uh, you're gonna have to do this, and yeah, you're gonna have that. Okay. So uh, for this lab, you're gonna get a bunch of starter codes. Uh, you, know, you can actually download uh, these starter codes just by clicking on uh, here. Okay. And uh, those starter codes are all Faust programs. I just want to show you how they work, so that you kind of have an idea of what this is gonna do. Okay. So all these Faust programs implement some kind of resonators slash physical model that's uh, compatible with the signal that you're going to get from the piezo, okay? And uh, probably the most uh, simple one is the Carpestron. So I'm going to open the Carpestron. I guess it's not happening, but I need to unzip 
this folder somewhere on the computer, so I'm just going to put it here. Lab 4. Okay, and then I'm going to open the Faust ID. So that's an example. Why is it not okay? I guess this is the best topic that always means in sunny college. Okay. So uh, that example has an audio input. Okay. That audio input is going through a DC blocker. So the reason why there is a DC blocker here, so you know, a DC blocker is something that's going to realign a signal on zero. Okay. So say that. So. If you produce a sine wave, like a good sine wave looks like this, okay? But uh, in some cases, uh, your signal might be not centered on zero. So a uh, sine wave with the DC offset is going to look like this. So that would be a sine wave with a DC offset. Like, you, know, you could say, for example, DC offset here is 0 0.5, so your sine wave is not centered on zero, it's centered on 0 0.5. This is something that can happen with uh, piezos. Like piezos can actually create uh, DC offsets. So to prevent this, uh, we use a DC blocker here to make sure that we're not going to have like an offset of the signal. Okay. Uh, then this is going through a carpus strong algorithm. Did we talk about the carpus strong algorithm already, or I forgot? Did we? Or I don't think we. I don't think we did. Okay. So. Uh, I guess we have a bit of time. I, I can talk about it. Okay, so uh, I'm sure many of you here know about the carpus strong algorithm, because uh, especially like karma, masters, you know, crop, know about the carpus strong algorithm. But uh, I just want to very quickly talk about it, so because uh, it's really part of the history of this place. So the carpus strong algorithm is the most primitive and most basic string physical model algorithm that you can uh, implement. Okay, And uh, essentially, uh, the way it works is that it's just a feedback loop with a delay and some kind of damping factor. Okay, So uh, the reason why I'm talking about the carpus strong algorithm here is, again, because it's uh, associated a lot to the history of this place. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe I just uh, want to say a couple of words about this. So, uh, in the 70s, uh, in the electrical engineering department, uh, there were uh, these two guys who were PhD students, and uh, uh, it was Alex Karplus, and uh, I forgot the first name of Strong, but uh, well, it was uh, Karplus and Strong, you know, and, uh, and they were working on uh, feedback, loop, feedback loops in digital circuits. And, uh, and they were doing like circuit analysis, you know, and that was their, uh, I think that was like their PhD uh, topic, you know, they were working on this, you know. And one day, uh, very late, they decided to uh, see what would happen if they were connecting a speaker to their uh, feedback loop uh, analog electronic circuit. And then they realized that it sounded like a guitar string. Um, and, uh, and then they were like, oh, that's weird, uh, and, uh, and they didn't know why, you know, like, and, uh, it wasn't really very clear for them. So uh, their advisor uh, in the electrical engineering uh, department told them, you know, there is this thing uh, in the artificial intelligence lab called Karma. Because uh, at the time, Karma wasn't here, it was part of the artificial intelligence lab, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was uh, on. It was very close to Slack. It was like on Sand Hill Road, you know, like, you know and so uh, now the building doesn't exist anymore. They, they they got rid of it. But Karma started in the artificial intelligence lab. Uh, not really sure why, you know, like, but uh, and that was like in the seventies. 
And, uh, and so, uh, so, uh, so they, uh, they, they went to Karma, and, uh, and then they, uh, they found G.D. Smith, uh, who was also starting his PhD uh, there, you know, and, uh, and then they, uh, they, they talked to him and they were like, do you know why it sounds like this dream? And then Jesus was like, yeah, of course, you know, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then it was like, because it's a very, it's a very simple string physical model that you have, you know. And, uh, and then Julius was like, okay, there's probably something to do with this, you know, and, uh, and eventually that became uh, Julius's uh, PhD uh, thesis uh, topic, which was waveguide physical modeling of musical instruments. And, uh, and then he realized that the approach that these guys found for analog circuits was working very well in the digital world and could be exported to pretty much uh, any uh, musical instruments, not just strings, but also wind instruments, you know, and, uh, and percussions, and, uh, et cetera. You know, and, uh, and then eventually, uh, Jesus became faculty here and uh, became very famous, you know, and, uh, and so uh, he's still teaching now, even though I think he's uh, retiring very, very, very soon. So, uh, uh, and uh, this gave birth uh, to this uh, piece of music called uh, Silicone uh, Valley uh, Breakdown. <laughs> And uh, by David Jaffe, that you might see sometimes at Carmichael Williams. Uh, it was the first piece of music that was using physical models of musical instruments. Anyway, Silicon Valley breakdown. Uh, it doesn't really sound like a string, and uh, <laughs> like the carbon strong that you're gonna make is gonna sound much better than this. And uh, the main reason is because at the time uh, they were using very low sampling rates, and uh, and so uh, the carbon strong algorithm uh, and the sound it makes really depends a lot on the sampling rate of the system that you use. You know, and uh, at the time I don't know they were probably limited at 16 kilohertz or something like this. You know, so sounds. Not so good, but anyway, that's the carbon strong algorithm. So uh, in Faust, uh, you have an implementation of the carbon strong algorithm, which is part of the physical modeling library. And basically, you can control two parameters. You can control the length of the string, uh, which uh, obviously is going to impact uh, the pitch, right? And uh, you can also control the mute. So the mute will basically uh, impact how muted your string is going to be, you know? And so, if you run this program, and uh, if you send, uh, okay, I'm going to play with fire, so uh, be careful guys, because uh, uh, might want to protect your ears, that's uh, what I'm saying here. Uh, maybe I'm just going to do that, okay? So, get sound. Quiet. Ah. Ooh. <laughs> yes. All right. So I think the mute is pretty high right now. There we go. So. So right now I'm sending the microphone of my computer into the carpet strong algorithm, right? So, so see that it sounds like a string. This is the microphone my computer is here. Okay. So, so it, it's pretty cool, right? And uh, if you change the string length, you make the string longer. Basically, if you replace the uh, 
sell of the built-in microphone on my computer uh, with a piezo, it's gonna sound pretty good, basically. You know, like, uh, and so that's kind of the idea for this slide. You know, like the it's like explore what you can do uh, with things like this. So uh, you see that this program actually has an audio. Input. So far, we haven't made fast programs with an audio input. So it's it's pretty straightforward. You know, like, you know and the way you're gonna deal with this is very well documented in the lab uh, for the Arduino side. You know, like, but. Uh, you're gonna have to connect the uh, uh, TNZ audio shield to this program, uh, and then uh, you know just do the same thing as uh, as usual. So uh, that's the carpet storm algorithm. Another um, one that I wanted to show you, which is potentially interesting, is the model model. Okay, this is the model model. Okay, and. Uh, all right, so model synthesis. So what is model synthesis? So if you uh, take an object that makes sounds and uh, this object is linear, so what does it mean that an object is linear? It means that basically uh, its shape is not changing in real time, okay? So, uh, if you take like a metal plate and you strike the metal plate, the metal plate will make sound. The shape of the metal plate is not changing in real time. It's static, right? Okay. So, uh, do you know of a musical instrument whose the shape is gonna change a little bit in real time? Uh, like very fast and potentially like, uh, me like producing nonlinear nonlinear behavior. Thank you. You had a suggestion. There's loads. Uh, all of everything does it to an extent. Mark Rao uh, had a really interesting project modeling resonator guitars with like the metal circle on them, and it turns out those uh, follow exactly a dumping oscillator. Yeah. Like so. All musical instruments are somewhat nonlinear, but in many cases you can sort of just ignore the fact that they're nonlinear because the nonlinearities you get are very, very, very small. Okay. Uh, yeah. Would something like an accordion count? No, an accordion is fairly well. It's not like the shape of the instrument, like the physical shape. It's the shape of what generates the sound, basically. You know, and uh, so uh, so in the, in the case of the accordion, it doesn't really work. No, but like the typical example of this is a gong. You know, so you know, like a gong. You know, because the thing with the gong is that the terminations of the gong, you know, are not very rigid. So when waves propagate uh, to the uh, extremities, the extremities of the gong are actually like sort of deforming. And, and so the reflections uh, at the boundaries of the system are reflected in a way that's not very clean, basically. You know, like, you know, and so, so they are, like, typically what I'm saying is that you cannot model a gong with this. Okay. So the way this works is that you put a bunch of resonant filters in parallel. Okay. And uh, you put a bunch of resonant filters in parallel, and each filter is going to implement a mode of. Uh, are you okay? Or, yeah. A beat is not a beat. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> That's. Uh, is it dead or. No, no, no. It's just crawling in its way. Well, I guess if it stung you, it's probably dead. Like most of the, I think they can only sting you once, right? So, uh, okay. Wildlife at karma. <laughs> okay, I need. I don't know why. They, all right, I'm telling you all these stories uh, today, but um, but uh, I don't know. I feel like this is part of the life of karma, you know. Like, but uh, uh, so when they, they like karma has like a lot of history with wildlife, you know, and, uh, and I guess that's because we're in the back of campus, you know, like, but uh, so there are a lot of owls at Karma, and they, they live in the Chinese, 
and uh, and you might see them, uh, you know, in the evening, you know, especially like if you park your bike here, sometimes they watch you, and uh, and they're pretty big, you know, and uh, <laughs> one day one of the owls uh, decided to make this little funny joke where. Uh, every single animal that uh, it would catch, like rats or whatever, it would actually dump them in the fireplace, like in the chimney, you know, and it would just land here, you know. And one day there started to be you know, like this horrible smell in the classroom, and no one knew where it was coming from, you know. And, uh, like you could barely like still teach in there, you know, like it really smelled like there was like a dead rat somewhere, and. No one knew where it was coming from, you know. And after six months, you know, like pest control coming and checking every single thing, they realized that behind this, it was like a cemetery of all the rats <laughs> around <laughs> Karma. <laughs> and that the owl just said. <laughs> anyway, what life? What my life at Karma? So. Uh, the way this works is that you have a bunch of resonant filters in parallel. Uh, each filter is implementing a mode of resonance of the system. So here you have one, two, three, four modes. Okay. So if you take a glass, you strike the glass, you record the sound of the glass, and you look at the spectrum of the sound, you're going to see the modes. Okay. So each of these guys is implementing a single mode. The way this system works is that you can configure uh, the ratio of uh, the mode in function of the fundamental frequency of the system. So for example, if you say that the fundamental frequency is 300, 300 hertz, the first mode is going to have a frequency of 300, the second one 600 the next one, etc., etc. Okay, so this is used as a multiplier for the fundamental frequency of the mode. Okay, then you can control their gain, uh, and that's like the initial gain of the mode. So you see that here it starts at one. The next one is 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.5, and you can also control the duration of the resonance of the mode. Okay, so here you say that the first mode will resonate for one second. This Next mode will resonate for 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.5 seconds. Okay, and the result of this is okay. Uh, oh, I guess that's just quiet. I can't really put it louder because if I put it louder, it's going to feed back. So it sounds like the part was strong, except that now you actually have control on every independent mode in the system. Okay, so I really advise you to try to play with this. Uh, and uh, if you add more, like you can make this sound like a metal plate, you can make this sound like a glass, you can make this sound like a string, just playing around with those parameters. You know, like try to see what happens if you make the T60s, so the duration of the resonance shorter. What happens if you make it longer, okay? Uh, what happens if you change the ratio of the modes? What happens if you add more modes? Currently, we only have four. You can add like five or six. So, using this, you could easily reproduce the sound of a lot of things that are around you. You know, like, and again, the way you do it is that potentially you record the sound of something. You look at its spectrum. You display the spectrogram, and, uh, and uh, there are a lot of tools you can find even online to to do this. And then you just spot the position of all the modes, and, and then you can map that to those parameters. You know, you can get the gain, you can get the frequency, and you look at the duration of the resonance. And so, uh, so I really advise you to check this out, like because this is uh, potentially like a very powerful uh, thing to try. Okay. Do you have any questions about this or no? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Could you re-explain what modes here refers to? So, yeah, I'm sorry. 
this was not necessarily very clear. So uh, <laughs> basically, uh, any object that makes sound uh, produces harmonics. Okay, so. Uh, Sine wave is a single harmonic, but the sound of my voice, for example, is made out of a combination of a lot of sine waves, uh, which are all harmonics. Okay, so uh, the modes are basically uh, the harmonics. Okay, so here we're just producing harmonics, but we call them modes because when you have an like a physical object, uh, and this physical object uh, is deforming. Uh, like the, the shape of the deformation of the object are called the modes, but they are all linked to a harmonic and to a sine wave. So, so basically, uh, you know, if you strike a glass, like the glass will vibrate and uh, it will vibrate in different directions, and those different directions are all modes of resonance. Okay, and and so here we're just synthesizing them. And, I'm sorry, this is a little bit like quick <laughs> as an explanation for what a mode is, but it doesn't matter. Like it, it will be self-explanative uh, when you try to play with this. Any other question? Or did I answer your question? So somewhat. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, you guys did a very very good job with homework one. Like that that was like very. Very, very good. So, uh, so please keep like very good job. So keep keep it up. Uh, I just want to talk very briefly about the homework for this week, uh, which is in lab three. Oh, I forgot to post it. Well, that's uh, okay. I'll uh, all right. Give me just uh, one second. Uh, all right, because I think it's better if you guys actually see it. <laughs> uh, so. Sorry, I was pretty sure I posted it. Sorry about that. Well, I think this uh, needs to use on uh, May 3rd. The goal of this homework is to use the Teensy uh, to make a musical instrument using sensors and sound synthesis. You know, like, so basically, lab one was Faust, lab two was uh, using the Teensy uh, with Faust, yeah, and lab three is using the Teensy with Faust and sensors. Okay, so. Design an instrument running on the Teensy, combining a bunch of sensors and a sound synthesizer, sound synthesizer implemented in Faust. Uh, feel free to explore the various sensors which are part of your kit. Your instrument should involve at least one discrete element, such as a button, and one continuous element, such as a potentiometer. Uh, think about the mapping strategies you'll be using on the sensors. Does it make percussive sound, uh, are all parameters linear as opposed to logarithmic, for example. Make sure that your instrument is, a, as usual, it's a good instrument, it's playable, it's beautiful and artful and everything else. Uh, uh, think about the form versus the function of your instrument. Uh, feel free to wrap it into something, dress it or whatever, you know. So, so like what I'm saying is that at this point, uh, because you're starting to deal with physical stuff, uh, you should feel uh, free to 
start making objects that are sort of a little bit more than just uh, the Teensy and the outer shield and a bunch of sensors. You know, like so. So if you want to dress up your Teensy as I don't know, like a Furby or something like this, you know, and, a, and like the 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 way you interact with it is by like squishing it or poking its eye, you know, like or something like this. That's okay. You know, like that's uh, in, in fact we really encourage you to do something like this. Well, not not the Furby, but uh, you know, just uh, it, it's time to sort of uh, take the sensors out of the uh, uh, of the breadboard. Okay. Then you make a video, you send the video to Kimia and I, and uh, and then uh, we're uh, done. Do you have any questions? Should be very straightforward. <laughs>